what's outside the universe? I usually had good answers for science questions. I was sort of a library guy. But this time, I had no idea what to say. The question scared me. I don't know what's at the edge of the universe. Well, nothing. The universe is everything, and it doesn't make any sense to ask what's outside of everything. Everything is everything. Yeah, but if the universe has an edge, there must be something beyond the edge, she reasoned. And we thought about it for a long time, and finally I said, maybe there is no edge and no outside. Yeah, maybe the universe just goes on forever and ever, and that's all there is. But before we go too far, we need to answer a very important question. What is the universe? Picture the last time you were out in wilderness and you looked up at the night sky. Thousands of pinpoints of light, photons from stars and galaxies, thousands of light years away, a light year being the distance that light travels in one year, to finally reach Earth and smack into your eyes. When you look up at the constellations, you're looking backward in time. But look closer. Between two of those points of light, what do you see? It looks like empty space, but it's not. Your eyes are pretty good photon detectors for one particular type of photon, but on cosmic scales, your eyes are terrible experimental apparatuses because they can only see a relatively narrow range of photon wavelengths. And there's much more smacking into the Earth than what we can see with our eyes. <clears throat> If you were to use humanity's best photon detectors, like satellite telescopes, you'd see hidden light, photons from stars and galaxies millions and billions of light years away. And eventually, if you keep looking, you will see something absolutely remarkable, the cosmic microwave background radiation, light, signals from when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. This is the closest that we can get to a baby picture of our universe. But wait a minute. Baby picture? A few hundred thousand years old? That's a pretty old baby. Where's the light from before then? Most of that light hasn't had time to reach us yet, and most of it never will. The universe is expanding. All of those galaxies you can see with your eyes, they're all moving away from each other in all directions. The universe is expanding, but expanding into what? Is our universe like a, a limp balloon put into a box and then you blow it up and the balloon is inflating into the box? No. So what's expanding? Space itself is expanding. The background metric spatial grid upon which everything rests is being stretched, even inside your body right now, completely imperceptibly. Two galaxies in our universe are like two pins stuck into a rubber sheet that is then being pulled from all directions. From the perspective of an ant on the sheet, nothing happened to make the pins move. The, the, the fabric of space itself, the sheet, is being stretched, and the distance between them is increasing. Thus, if everything in the universe is moving apart from everything else, we can simply run the clock backward, and at some point, everything in the universe had to be packed into a tiny, dense little point, which then started expanding. And this, as you know, is the concept of the Big Bang. But it's not just the fact of the universe's expansion that is interesting. It's the particular way that it did so throughout its history. There's so much that we can't explain right now if the universe always expanded at a constant rate. Why are there big things in the universe at all, like galaxies and cosmic structures that clever astronomers can see? Why does the stuff in that part of the sky more or less look like the stuff in the other part of the sky over there? Why is this cosmic microwave background radiation essentially uniform in temperature everywhere? Don't let the color coding fool you. My astrophysics colleagues are quite clever to show the tiny gradations, but that's basically constant. 
None of this stuff makes any sense unless at the moment of the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, the universe didn't just start expanding at a constant rate, but instead insanely inflated and then tapered off to a much more gradual rate. And this, this inflation was not just some minor thing. Imagine if we took a horse and magically inflated it to the size of the observable universe now in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. That's what inflation was like at the moment of the Big Bang. This inflation was much faster than the speed of light. And as you know, if something in the universe, if, if we're ever going to know that something exists in the universe, we have to receive some kind of a light signal from it. Thus, if this expansion was much faster than the speed of light, most of the stuff in the universe was immediately separated from us and we'll never be able to, to detect it ever. Not just the universe, but the observable universe, which is a tiny volume, a subset of the entire universe within which there must be a large number of other observable universes for other observers, and we'll never be able to contact them ever. If you look closely, and you should always do this when someone gives you a physical theory, if you look closely at the math behind it, really at the details of the math behind this insane inflation of the fabric of space, this insane inflation should go on forever. But in our universe, it didn't. It tapered off and is going to, has been going at a much gra more gradual rate for the rest of the universe's history. This, our universe is essentially a little pocket that was popped into existence by this insane inflation of the fabric of space, like a little bubble that popped up and is kind of just floating there in this gradual thing. But if you look closely at that insane inflation, it should go on forever. But in our universe, it didn't. One universe popped up, but this, this inflation should go on for infinity. And as you know, with infinity, if something happens once, it happens again and again, and again. There must be, if our understanding of this inflation is correct, there must be an almost infinite number of other universes that were also popped into existence by this insane inflation of the fabric of space. In most of them, uh, structure probably never formed and, and there was nothing, the constants of nature were wrong so that nothing ever formed and, and there's no humans, there's no life, there's no nothing. But with infinity, there must be other universes like ours. In one of them, one of you wore different shoes here today. In another, coffee is pink. And in another, an Earth-like planet was obliterated by an asteroid just as protozoans were starting to evolve. If our understanding of inflation is correct, this mathematics of inflation is correct, then this isn't just some science fiction idea, but is required by infinity. But I can see the looks on some of your faces, and you're absolutely right to be skeptical, because look, I'm a scientist, right? You should be screaming at me, this is a fine idea, but where is the evidence, man? We need demonstration, and you're absolutely right. As it stands now, this is just a circumstantial evidence idea, right? It's not enough to claim a discovery, and no one's claiming such a thing. But it turns out, this is not the only piece of circumstantial evidence that we have. Um, <laughs> our universe seems to be filled with magic numbers, constants of nature that we measure and we know what their value are, but we, can't have, we don't have any particular explanation for why these values are what they are. And one of them, is very important, it's uh, called the, uh, the mass of the Higgs boson. You don't need to know what that is now, but it's related to this particle that my, part uh, my, my colleagues and I discovered at the Large Hadron Collider a few years ago. And this particle is a very important and very weird particle. As a reminder, the Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland. And these, just to go back up one second, so these constants of nature, or these things that we measure, there's a lot of them, and this Higgs boson mass is just one that I'm going to talk about. But if any of these values were, in fact, a little bit different, our universe would be a vastly different place. And one of them has to do with this Higgs boson, discovered here at the Large Hadron Collider, 27 kilometers on the border of France and Switzerland. And for contrast, this is what it would look like if it were around Malmo. 
So I don't know if anyone lives out in this small town called Oxy, but uh, if you happened if, if you happen to uh, uh, live there and you were a proton, you could get to Slughuset in about uh, a few nanoseconds uh, in, the, in the Large Hadron Collider. Because in this machine, we take superconducting magnets that are colder than outer space, and we use them to accelerate protons, you're made of protons, to almost the speed of light. And then we smash them into each other millions of times per second. And we collect a debris of these collisions to look for uh, to then sift through all of this data that we collect to look for evidence of new, undiscovered particles that could answer some of the biggest open questions of physics. And the bigness of these open questions of physics is nicely concordant with the bigness of the experiment. And so the experiment that I work on is one of the places, at the four places on the ring where you bend these beams into each other and a collision happens. And the place where the collision happens, you better build a gigantic detector because quantum field theory magic is going to happen. And by gigantic, I mean gigantic. If you look closely, and you should always do this when someone gives you a physical theory, if you look closely at the math behind it, really at the details of the math behind this insane inflation of the fabric of space, this insane inflation should go on forever. But in our universe, it didn't. It tapered off and it's going to, has been going at a much gra more gradual rate for the rest of the universe's history. This, our universe is essentially a little pocket that was popped into existence by this insane inflation of the fabric of space, like a little bubble that popped up and is kind of just floating there in this gradual thing. But if you look closely at that insane inflation, it should go on forever. But in our universe, it didn't. One universe popped up, but this, this inflation should go on for infinity. And as you know, with infinity, if something happens once, it happens again and again and again. There must be, if our understanding of this inflation is correct, there must be an almost infinite number of other universes that were also popped into existence by this insane inflation of the fabric of space. In most of them, uh, structure probably never formed and, and there was nothing, the constants of nature were wrong so that nothing ever formed and, and there's no humans, there's no life, there's no nothing. But with infinity, there must be other universes like ours. In one of them, one of you wore different shoes here today. In another, coffee is pink. And in another, an Earth-like planet was obliterated by an asteroid just as protozoans were starting to evolve. If our understanding of inflation is correct, this mathematics of inflation is correct, then this isn't just some science fiction idea, but is required by infinity. But I can see the looks on some of your faces, and you're absolutely right to be skeptical, because look, I'm a scientist, right? You should be screaming at me, this is a fine idea, but where is the evidence, man? We need demonstration, and you're absolutely right. As it stands now, this is just a circumstantial evidence idea, right? It's not enough to claim a discovery, and no one's claiming such a thing. But it turns out, this is not the only piece of circumstantial evidence that we have. Um, <laughs> our universe seems to be filled with magic numbers, constants of nature that we measure and we know what their value are, but we, can't we don't have any particular explanation for why these values are what they are. And one of them, is very important, it's uh, called the, uh, the mass of the Higgs boson. You don't need to know what that is now, but it's related to this particle that my, part uh, my, my colleagues and I discovered at the Large Hadron Collider a few years ago. And this particle is a very important and very weird particle. As a reminder, the Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland. And these, just to go back up one second, so these constants of nature, or these things that we measure, there's a lot of them, and this Higgs boson mass is just one that I'm gonna talk about. But if any of these values were in fact a little bit different, our universe would be a vastly different place. And one of them has to do with this Higgs boson, discovered here at the Large Hadron Collider, 27 kilometers on the border of France and Switzerland. And for contrast, this is what it would look like if it were around Malmo. So I don't know if anyone lives out in this small town called Oxy, but uh, if, you happened, if, if you happened to uh, uh, live there and you were a proton, you could get to Slughuset in about uh, a few nanoseconds uh, in, the, in the Large Hadron Collider. Because in this machine, we take superconducting magnets that are colder than outer space, and we use them to accelerate protons, you're made of protons, to almost the speed of light. And then we smash them into each other millions of times per second 
And we collected debris of these collisions to look for, uh, to then sift through all of this data that we collect to look for evidence of new undiscovered particles that could answer some of the biggest open questions of physics. And the bigness of these open questions of physics is nicely concordant with the bigness of the experiment. And so the experiment that I work on is one of the places at the four places on the ring where you bend these beams into each other and a collision happens. And the place where the collision happens, you better build a gigantic detector because quantum field theory magic is going to happen. And by gigantic, I mean gigantic. Picture the last time you were out in wilderness and you looked up at the night sky. Thousands of pinpoints of light, photons from stars and galaxies, thousands of light years away, a light year being the distance that light travels in one year, to finally reach Earth and smack into your eyes. When you look up at the constellations, you're looking backward in time. But look closer. Between two of those points of light, what do you see? It looks like empty space, but it's not. Your eyes are pretty good photon detectors for one particular type of photon, but on cosmic scales, your eyes are terrible experimental apparatuses because they can only see a relatively narrow range of photon wavelengths. And there's much more smacking into the Earth than what we can see with our eyes. <clears throat> If you were to use humanity's best photon detectors, like satellite telescopes, you'd see hidden light, photons from stars and galaxies millions and billions of light years away. And eventually, if you keep looking, you will see something absolutely remarkable, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Light signals from when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. This is the closest that we can get to a baby picture of our universe. But wait a minute, baby picture, a few hundred thousand years old, that's a pretty old baby. Where's the light from before then? Most of that light hasn't had time to reach us yet, and most of it never will. The universe is expanding. All of those galaxies you can see with your eyes, they're all moving away from each other in all directions. The universe is expanding, but expanding into what? Is our universe like a, a limp balloon put into a box and then you blow it up and the balloon is inflating into the box? No. So what's expanding? Space itself is expanding. The background metric spatial grid upon which everything rests is being stretched, even inside your body right now, completely imperceptibly. Two galaxies in our universe are like two pins stuck into a rubber sheet that is then being pulled from all directions. From the perspective of an ant on the sheet, nothing happened to make the pins move. The, the, the fabric of space itself, the sheet, is being stretched, and the distance between them is increasing. Thus, if everything in the universe is moving apart from everything else, we can simply run the clock backward, and at some point, everything in the universe had to be packed into a tiny, dense little point, which then started expanding. And this, as you know, is the concept of the Big Bang. But it's not just the fact of the universe's expansion that is interesting. It's the particular way that it did so throughout its history. There's so much that we can't explain right now if the universe always expanded at a constant rate. Why are there big things in the universe at all, like galaxies and cosmic structures that clever astronomers can see? Why does the stuff in that part of the sky more or less look like the stuff in the other part of the sky over there? Why is this cosmic microwave background radiation essentially uniform in temperature everywhere? Don't let the color coding fool you. My astrophysics colleagues are quite clever to show the tiny gradations, but that's basically constant. None of this stuff makes any sense unless at the moment of the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, the universe didn't just start expanding at a constant rate, but instead insanely inflated and then tapered off to a much more gradual rate. And this, this inflation was not just some minor thing. 
Imagine if we took a horse and magically inflated it to the size of the observable universe now in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. That's what inflation was like at the moment of the Big Bang. This inflation was much faster than the speed of light. And as you know, if something in the universe, if, if we're ever going to know that something exists in the universe, we have to receive some kind of a light signal from it. Thus, if this expansion was much faster than the speed of light, most of the stuff in the universe was immediately separated from us and we'll never be able to, to detect it ever. Why is every galaxy in the universe spinning way faster than it should? So, uh, take your favorite Hubble telescope photo of a galaxy, like a spiral galaxy. I love to look at Hu Hubble photos, and I've never gotten rid of that love. Take your favorite one, and then count up all the stuff you can see, all the stars and all the gas and stuff. This gives you an estimate of the amount of visible matter in the universe. And now, take your favorite textbook on gravity and general relativity. I assume all of you have a textbook on general relativity on the bedside, like I do. You take that matter, you plug it into the equation that says how fast a star should be moving as a function of how far away from the center of the galaxy it is. This gets a straightforward calculation. Now, go out and measure how fast those stars are moving. It's way off from the prediction. And it's not just a little bit off, it's way off. And it's not just one galaxy, it's all of them. Everyone is completely wrong. This means that one of two things is really wrong. Either gravity is wrong, and it's probably not. Or there's got to be more stuff there than what we can see with our eyes. And if it's not light, if it doesn't interact with light, then it's dark, hence dark matter. And it turns out there's not just a little dark matter. As you can see from the deviation there, there's about five to six times more dark matter in the universe than there is you matter. Every single one of you probably has about a billion particles of dark matter flowing through your body every second, and you've never felt it, and you never will. So this gives you a sense as to, this is kind of an important question. We should figure out what the answer to this is. Is it a particle? Is it something else? So this is one of the big questions that we can, we can address at the Large Hadron Collider. And prior, to its turning on about 10 years ago, there were a large number of big questions, and one of them had to do with this Higgs boson particle, which is a very important particle, a very weird particle. And it's important because without the Higgs boson particle, you would not be here right now. So the Higgs boson is a very important particle. Well, let me just, so prior to it turning on, the LHC turning on, this was a big open question. Is the Higgs boson, does it exist? Does this Higgs field exist? Um, and then after, at once 2012 ran, uh, came around, we discovered this particle, it was fantastic. There was champagne and celebration and two white males won a Nobel Prize, what else is new? And there was also a little, little bit of head scratching too, because honestly, we probably shouldn't have discovered this particle at all. This particle is important for the following reason. <laughs> um, the Higgs boson is not the most important thing about this discovery. We talk about this all the time, the boson, and if you know anything about particle physics, it has a particular, that means particular values of some of its intrinsic properties, doesn't matter. But the boson particle, the particle part, is not the most important thing. The most important part of this discovery was the fact that the Higgs boson demonstrates conclusively that there's something called the Higgs field that exists. And the Higgs field is more or less an invisible jelly that permeates all of space everywhere. You don't feel it, but your particles do. And your particles feel this field because they have mass. And mass for a particle is not the same thing that you and I use in a colloquial sense. It's like, whoa, look at that massive building or something like that. Mass for particles is an intrinsic property. It's a number put there by nature. And it seems that certain particles have certain types of masses because they're dragged a little bit by this Higgs field. If I'm a, an electron and I'm zipping through space, a little bit of my kinetic energy is stuck into a point that we measure as mass. And this is related to this concept of E equals mc squared. This is one of Einstein's most famous equations, showing that there's an equivalence between energy and mass. And energy, would, you know, but then mass is this thing where it's stuck a little bit into a point and we measure this thing as mass. 
And it's really good that this Higgs field exists because if you're, for example, if electrons had a zero mass in the absence of a Higgs field, if your electrons had a zero mass, you and I would not be here to have this discussion because an electron with a zero mass would never have started to form atoms in the early universe. And it's pretty good that atoms started to form. <laughs> So this is, this is one example as to why you know, it's important that, we, that, that, that this type of a discovery actually gives us larger uh, implications as to, what, you know, uh, 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 as to our place in the universe. And again, I'm, I'm seeing some of the looks on your faces, and of course you should again be yelling at me, invisible jelly, how are you going to demonstrate that? It's a very good question. Imagine if you were, uh, imagine you're standing on a bridge in the night, completely dark night. You're standing on this bridge, and a friend has told you that down below underneath the bridge, there's a muddy river. Maybe you're an enthusiast of muddy rivers. You have like an Instagram account that's dedicated to muddy rivers. I don't know. But you're there, and you look down, and you don't see anything. It's a completely pitch black night. You look down, and you don't see a thing at all. You have a flashlight. You shine the flashlight down, but you can't see anything moving. It just looks like dirt. You think maybe your friend has lied to you. So you think, how from up here, it's maybe you know, 100 meters below or something, how from up here could I ever possibly demonstrate that there's a river down there? You could drop a rock. So you drop a rock, and just as it splashes, you hear, see a little splash that exists for a small amount of time, but then it dies and it goes into a completely uh, flat space again. You've demonstrated very temporarily and briefly that that field, or that, that, uh, that muddy river does indeed exist. And in this case, the muddy river is this invisible Higgs field. And the rock, or I'm sorry, the, the, the vortex, that little, that little splash, that's the Higgs boson particle. And the rock is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. If you take reality and smack it just right, with just the right resonant frequency, you can make this Higgs boson vibrate into existence for a small amount of time before it then decays and goes back into nothing. So this is how we were able to demonstrate that this Higgs field existed. And without the Higgs field, you would not be here right now because atoms would not have formed. So it's good that the Higgs field exists. But, Again, go back to the math. Anytime someone so shows you something about a physical theory, go and talk it, look at the math. If you look at the math behind all this stuff, there's nothing to prevent our Higgs boson mass from being something gigantically high, all way outside of the range of the Large Hadron Collider. There's nothing to prevent that. And in physics, if something is not prevented, it has to happen. But we found the Higgs boson down here. Again, it's really good that we did, because you would not be here if we had not found this Higgs boson with this particular mass. But there's got to be something that's preventing it from being all the way up here. One good idea is if there were some extra particles that we also discovered at the Large Hadron Collider, that through some complicated interactions, they help regulate the Higgs boson mass and kind of keep it bumped right where we discovered it. That would be great. We do not see these particles at the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> Why is the Higgs boson mass sitting right where it is? Did we just get lucky? Maybe it is just luck, but a particular type of luck. Nature loves statistical distributions. I doubt you will hear a nerdier statement all day long. Nature loves statistical distributions. The average resting heart rate of everyone in this room will be distributed as a Gaussian distribution. If you stand on the street corner, the rate with which cars will pass you follows some kind of Poisson distribution. Nature loves statistical distributions, and in a sense, it seems like sometimes physics, uh, sorry, math and statistics transcend our universe. So what if our Higgs boson mass is only one of a possibly infinite number of Higgs boson masses in a multiverse. One of them was stable, led to a stable universe where you and I are here to have this discussion, and most of the other ones, the Higgs boson mass was something completely different, and these are completely dull, empty, void universes, and you never want a vacation there. The lack of extra particles at the Large Hadron Collider is not definitive demonstration proof 
that we live in a multiverse, but it's another circumstantial hint that we should take seriously this idea. But again, I see and acknowledge and love the looks on your faces right now because you're absolutely right again. Tell me, listen, man, you're a scientist. You need evidence, and you're absolutely 100% right. You need to ask the question, how are we ever going to possibly test this idea? Is it just philosophy, or is it something we could possibly demonstrate and test? That's a very good question. The answer to it is that <clears throat> we have some ideas, but they're currently either very weird or technologically <clears throat> challenging to do at the moment. Um, one way is that we could look for a bruise on our universe. Remember that almost infinite number of universes in the multiverse due to this inflation of the fabric of space? What if two of them inflated or you know, evolved right next to each other, expanded right next to each other, and bumped into each other as they, as they expanded. Could that be what this little cold spot is here on this baby picture of the universe? It remains to be seen whether this conclusion is supported by the evidence, by the data, better than some other conclusion, but it's an open part, it's an open direction of inquiry right now. Another way is to look for new, revolutionary, high-mass particles that we haven't discovered yet, a.k.a. my day job. The largeness of experiments like the Large Hadron Collider is important because bigger machines allow you to go to higher energies and go back to the Einstein equation. If nature has a particle with a mass m that's all the way up here, and we as a species have only ever built a collider that goes up to energy here, we'll never be able to discover it and measure its properties. Thus, we need to push to directions, push to energy regimes, larger machines, where we simply haven't looked yet, because that's where the discoveries could be hiding. We don't choose where nature puts the discoveries. We only choose to keep exploring. So, a few months ago, we announced at CERN our, uh, a proposal plan to potentially build a, an even bigger collider at CERN. This would be the future circular collider. If the Large Hadron Collider is 27 kilometers around, this would be 100 kilometers around. And I live right in the middle there, somewhere there. Um, so this would be 100 kilometers around. It would allow us to get up to seven times the energies of what we can right now at the Large Hadron Collider. This would open up unparalleled potential discovery uh, opportunities. But, if we don't discover new particles at this, L at this FCC, because it, it actually would be okay. So if we discover these extra particles to help regulate the Higgs mass, if we discover them just outside of the range of the Large Hadron Collider, well within the range of this thing, that would only be a little bit weird. It would totally be really nice for us. We'd be like, okay, our universe is fine. It's awesome. Let's move on to other things to, to study. We don't have to worry about whether we live in a multiverse. It would be okay. But if we build this thing and we don't find new particles, would that satisfy me? Would that be satisfying enough for me to say, I think that we live in a multiverse? No. We would have to go bigger. Why not go as big as possible? Why not think big? Let's build a particle collider around the circumference of the moon. This would allow us to get to energies that are tens of thousands of times the energies of the Large Hadron Collider and allow us to enter completely unparalleled discovery potential. And you might think this is kind of a crazy idea, but think about it. There's a lot of innovators right now that are interested in going to the moon, setting up some kind of a moon base, doing some kind of moon uh, mining or things like that. Why not work together and make this happen? But obviously, I can't do this alone. I have a list of things. I know what I want from this project. I have a list of things that I'm going to need from somebody in this audience so that we can make this happen, okay? I'm going to need 11,000 kilometers worth of extremely strong magnets that don't currently exist. I'm going to need an amazing space transport system for personnel stuff, uh, you, know, uh, uh, res uh, you know, supplies, okay, something that's robust and, 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 and reliable. I need some kind of tunnel scouting and engineering and digging that doesn't currently exist. You know, we need to build a tunnel around the circumference of the moon. But wait a minute, maybe we don't need to build a tunnel. Maybe we could just put it on the surface and shield it from, from radiation, and we'll be good. So maybe we don't need some kind of self-directed robots to do tunnel scouting. Maybe we just need robots that do this, the, the, the stuff on the surface. So if you're a robotics person, get on this right now. I also need the next generation of particle uh, detector, the stuff that I work on at Atlas. 
This, this, we need things that are much, much more uh, finely uh, grained than we currently do. We need them to scale up much, much larger because the energy coming out of this collision is going to be way bigger than what we can currently measure with our current technology. I need data science methods that don't currently exist. The amount of data that would be coming out of this machine, we run for a few decades, exabyte level, probably lots more than that. Okay? So I need methods that don't exist yet to do uh, uh, data, uh, machine learning, deep learning ideas. I need some kind of robust Earth to Moon uh, uh, a data transfer system that's robust against solar flares and other types of disruptions. I need some kind of next generation power. Are we going to use nuclear on the, on, on the moon? But maybe we could just use solar because there's copious uh, sun coming in because there's no atmosphere. I also need all the other stuff I haven't thought of yet. <laughs> so what if we build the moon collider? would I then be satisfied? Maybe we build the Moon Collider, we don't find any new particles at all, and we then, I can then say, yes, we know that we live in a multiverse. Whoa. The answer is no, that's not big enough. No, to answer the question definitively, we would actually have to reach an energy called the Planck energy. We would have to reach something called the Planck scale. And this is such an unimaginably high energy scale at which everything about physics would be revealed. We would know everything about gravity, about dark matter, about how gravity and quantum mechanics work together, everything about neutrinos, about matter versus antimatter, about probably whether we live in a multiverse. We would need know everything about this, but to reach the Planck energy in a collider experiment, we would probably have to build a particle collider around the outer edge of the solar system. <laughs> Clearly, we're going to need some major innovation to make this happen. But luckily, we are at the conference, the conference, okay, and a place where I can't seem to walk three meters without running into a world-changing innovator or an aspiring world-changing innovator. So catch me, uh, catch me afterwards, and we'll brainstorm ways to make this happen. Um, <laughs> but. So this is the ultimate Hadron Collider. <laughs> if we were to build this ultimate Hadron Collider, and we will, what will we do with the answers that we get from it? Even if we were to provide overwhelming circumstantial evidence that you and I live in a multiverse, there's currently no way for us to ever contact or interact with another universe. Such a concept currently makes no sense. Thus, are such questions meaningless? You may say yes, and in fact, some scientists would agree with you. And in fact, some scientists attack our attempts to learn more about such questions by, uh, by attacking our plans to build, say, this FCC at CERN, saying that such questions are unscientific. But is that true? We started with known science, observations of the world around us, and we followed the chain of logic to arrive at the conclusion that we might live in a multiverse. No one's claiming that's the truth, but it's a possibility. It's very startling and scary, but it's definitely scientific. Just because we can't answer the question now doesn't mean that we never will. This sort of thing sounds impossible, but impossible, this is definitely impossible, impossible, but something like a moon collider, that's just regular impossible. And regular impossible we can do. Regular impossible is only impossible right up until that moment when somebody makes it possible. So, if we, so, so does that mean that these questions are non-scientific? It definitely does not. These are definitely scientific questions. So why do people object to questions like this? Could it be that they're afraid of the answer? Could it be that this is a similar fear that led people to object to questions, similar questions in the past, such as, is the Earth really at the center of the solar system? Or are the stars painted on a solid dome a kilometer above our heads? The fear that you and I are not really as special as we think we are. Perhaps more accurately, the fear that what you know right now is not all there is to know. But this fear is perhaps even more fundamental than the fear of knowledge or the fear that we are irrelevant to the universe, and it seems that we kind of are. It could be the fear 
of reconceptualizing humanity's very existence. A curious thing happens when you study physics, particle physics, quantum mechanics, and then quantum field theory for eight years. You start with the basic physical objects we encounter every day, like rocks and clouds, and you think about how they do anything, how they sit still, how they move, how they exist in these states. And you do that, and to do that, you consider the forces that act on them. So these are standard, everyday ideas that we as humans have evolved with and that are understandable to us. You calculate the various forces acting on a bridge, and you're pleased to understand why physics exists to help structural engineers design safe roads and buildings. And then you learn that the same essential set of ideas can help us understand why and how a rock thrown into the air will return to the Earth's surface and how the planets, stars, and galaxies move around each other, how electricity works, how a light bulb shines, etc. And then you take all these ideas and you go very small. Very small, to the realm of the smallest things imaginable, un individual, uncuttable particles. And while many of the same principles apply there too, very quickly, things become extremely different. At some point, you realize that our understanding of particles being discrete, separate chunks of stuff breaks down. You realize that depending upon how you look at it, something like an electron, for example, is either a particle, a small chunk of stuff, or is instead a miniature localized packet of vibrating waves. This wave-particle duality is not just some crazy idea, but is an observation and consequence of quantum mechanics, which is filled with starting, startling conclusions like this that challenge our big, bulky human conceptions of reality. And depending upon how you look at them, these conclusions are either limitations or liberations. For example, it's fundamentally impossible for me to know with arbitrary precision simultaneously where a given electron is and how fast it's moving. You might think that's strange, and you're right. Here on the surface of the Earth, I can stand still and watch, at, watch you as you zip past me in a wheelchair, and I will know exactly where you are the whole time, and I will know exactly how fast you're moving. With an electron, this is impossible. The more precisely I know the electron's position, the less I know about how fast it's moving. And the more precisely I know its speed, the less I know about where it is. This is wild. My human desire and hubris compels me to think that if I just work hard enough, just figure out some clever method, just wait for an advanced enough civilization, I should be able to know everything about everything. Isn't that superficially one of the driving forces of science? But quantum mechanics says, this is fundamentally impossible. There are limits to our knowledge, and not just science knowledge, not just regular knowledge, but knowledge itself. That's humbling and liberating, because these ideas challenge our core understandings of reality and force us to reframe our view of humanity's place in the world. It's disorienting, and it gets worse because it turns out that quantum mechanics is not the end of the story. When you take individual chunks of stuff and accelerate them to very high speeds, those approaching the speed of light, you realize that qu standard quantum mechanics doesn't cut it anymore. The behavior of a thing moving at almost the speed of light is best described by something called special relativity, another set of wild ideas that completely overturned our understanding of time and space, and when you combine this description with quantum mechanics, you get something called quantum field theory, the implications of which are absolutely breathtaking. Quantum field theory begins with the notion that for a given kind of particle, like our electron, every single electron in the universe is fundamentally indistinguishable from every other electron. Let's say I put a bunch of tennis balls in a washing machine. I can paint one of them black, 
and after letting them bump around for a while, I can easily find that black tennis ball still among the many yellow ones. I can tag an uh, a, a tennis ball. I cannot tag an electron. If I try to keep track of an electron, I send toward an atom, for example, an atom that already has a bunch of electrons swarming around it, and the electron bumps into the atom and another, another electron comes flying out the other side. It's impossible for me to state which electron this is and where the electron I sent in is now. There's no way to tag an electron. This means that an electron in an atom here in my hand and an electron currently in a star on the other side of the Milky Way are fundamentally identical. So perhaps the best way to think about an electron at all is not as an individual chunk of stuff, a discrete piece of the universe that I can track like a black tennis ball, but instead, perhaps an electron is really an excitation in a background quantum field that permeates all of space all throughout the universe. In this way of viewing things, the most fundamental object in the universe is not a particle, not an individual chunk of something, but, universe, but instead the universe-wide field that is everywhere all the time and from which any given particle can vibrate into existence temporarily as a small, small wobble in this field and then once it's done what it needed to do, it dissolves back into this field. This cosmic quantum field, this vast, smooth continuum of activity, possibility, and localized vibration everywhere in space all the time is the most fundamental way of describing our universe. You and I and everything in the universe are simply gloriously temporary collections of vibrations in fundamental quantum fields, and we wobble into existence just long enough to taste a perfectly ripe peach, watch a sunset while holding hands with another collection of quantum vibrations, <laughs> and help a temporary fellow being in need. And then we eventually return to the background field from which we arose a continuum field that has existed for as long as we can define time, space, and existence, and will probably always, always exist. The hottest and latest in physics requires a radical reframing of humanity's place in the universe, fundamentally shifting the focus from us, humans, as some kind of authoritative benchmarks of existence and perception, to the background continua, the contexts, within which we observe ourselves as having vibrated and evolved now. Not only and you, are you and I not the most prominent things in the universe, ours might not be the only universe. <laughs> and not only are you not any more or less important than any other human being, but if we were to zoom in and look at the particles of which you are composed, you and I are these sets of gloriously indistinguishable quantum uh, vibrations, uh, excitations in quantum fields. But although this quantum equitability is true at the scale of unfathomably huge and a tiny scale of the particles that compose you and me, you and I don't live and conduct our lives in either the level of expanding universes or the quantum realm. In some ways, this is a good thing. If I put an electron next to a solid barrier, there's a non-zero probability that I will suddenly measure the electron as existing on the other side of the barrier. This is a possibility of quantum mechanics, and we determine it, we measure it all the time, we observe it. Luckily, this is not true of you leaning against the door of a high-speed train. You and I conduct our lives on the scale of this, right here on the surface of the Earth with joy and pain and sorrow and pleasure and the notion that two humans are essentially indistinguishable sets of quantum vibrations in fields is cold comfort to a woman or a person of color or a gender non-conforming person or a person with a disability experiencing prejudice and bigotry at the hands of a privileged person. So I mention all of this 
Not because I think that this delicate observation that physics renders us all gloriously equal will have some kind of immediate effect on the current nearly catastrophic social and political situation in which we find ourselves, but it's an interesting metaphor, and it's a promising start because our current perception of the world around us is shaped by one particular set of dominant paradigms driven primarily by the culture, context, and society within which many of us exist, whether we chose to or not. This culture of profit, zero-sum competition, accumulation, and consumption, but perceptions can evolve, and paradigms can shift, and context can change, and metaphors, especially those that speak to the fundamental empirical nature of everything around us, can be very powerful. And this is good because shifting these sets of dominant attitudes is going to be very difficult. Hegemonies persist by unrelentingly convincing you that they're inevitable. And depending upon who you are within some given hegemony, the thing that often prevents you from disrupting it is fear. For those being subjugated, it's a real fear of physical harm. For those benefiting from it, it's a fear of a loss of privilege or more generally, a fear of change. This kind of softly, constantly bubbling fear shows up in a large number of places in our lives. For example, does this same fear affect you? What might happen if you quit your current job and you did that thing you've been thinking about for years, like starting a humanitarian organization? What might happen if, uh, if you, uh, what, what might happen if you uh, uh, decided that, uh, um, what might happen if, if you're, you know, if you're in the tech world or the innovation world, what, what might happen if you stopped working on a long series of smartphone apps and instead worked upon a bigger idea that you've been kind of thinking in the back of your head for a long time, like solving poverty or f coming up with a way of preventing governments from secretly surveilling their citizens? What might happen if you stopped working on what you're doing right now and instead worked on something gigantically awesome too? All of that stuff that I said about a particle collider around the moon or around the outer edge of the solar system, as awesome as that is, it's totally based upon extrapolations from existing current technology. What if instead you joined the effort to understand how to accelerate particles to higher energies within a much smaller space. So my colleagues are working on something called plasma wakefield acceleration. You can look up the details if you want, but in principle, if that were to come, if that were to, uh, come to fruition and come to, uh, to be able to be ready for, for prime time, in principle, we'd be able to reach the Planck scale in a much, much smaller space. What if you did this instead? What if, what if, what if, what if the answer to all of these questions is indeed quite possibly nothing, but you currently don't know that, and you never will unless you take this leap and find out. And to me, the safety of ignorance will never compete with the scary beauty and the terrifying joy of knowledge. Always seek, always ask the big question, always Allow yourself the bravery of stepping into the unknown and always seek out new knowledge to vanquish the fear because you know what? This fear distracts us from some of the key, basic, objective, physical truths of reality. You and I don't need to be afraid of an almost infinite number of universes. And you and I don't need to be afraid of reconceptualizing our position in the, in the universe as being some kind of central thing instead of being Instead, instead to some perception of us being temporary collections of vibrations and quantum fields. We don't need to be afraid of these things because at the end of the day, we know one thing for sure. There is at least one universe. And you and I are parts of that universe. And when you and I, humans, ask questions about the universe, we Humans are the method by which the universe asks questions about itself. And when I see 
the government of the United States putting children into literal cages on the U.S.-Mexico border. And when I see that the third largest political party in the Swedish parliament in 2019, 2019, is rooted in fascism, and its representatives continually use racist, xenophobic, misogynistic language. And when I, when I see that we're, we've allowed decades of unfettered global capitalism to essentially destroy the earth and we're not acting fast enough to fix it, and when I think about my friend Melody and how the other kids made fun of her because of the color of her skin, and how she had a difficult time going to class because of it, and how she never went to high school. I feel anger. It's not just regular anger. Oh, I feel regular anger too, but as a physicist, I feel an extra layer of anger because when we allow these things to happen, we're betraying a cosmic truth. You and I are parts of the same universe, and we're all in this universe together.